If you could convert the atom from this safety pin or a paper clip into pure energy, leaving no mass whatsoever, this would yield about 18 kilotons of TNT. That's roughly the size of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945. Today, I'm gonna share with you what I perceive to be the biggest threats to human society, because I believe each of these threats could destroy our way of life. Heck, some of these threats are existential in nature. And unfortunately, I feel like the odds of any one of these threats coming to fruition is growing in likelihood each and every year. Why? Because as technology advances exponentially and the interconnected nature of our world continues unabated, the probability and size of great human mistakes, they keep going up and up. And here's what's truly concerning. When you add up all the chances of at least one of the following nine threats occurring in our lifetimes, it seems all but certain that we've got some tough times ahead. Hey, I'm Jack, and I'm a co-founder of SkilledSurvival.com and TheResilientLife.com, and I've been helping thousands of people since 2013 get prepared and get more resilient to the future. So if I'm able to teach you something you didn't know today and you enjoy this video, do me a huge favor. Please subscribe and like and share this video because it really helps this channel out. Okay, number one, nuclear war. E equals MC squared. It's such a little compact equation doesn't seem all that scary without any context. Heck, it seems harmless, but that is massively misleading. The power in that tiny equation is enough to end all human civilization. In physics, energy and mass are different forms of the same thing. So if you're able to split an atom, you force the mass to convert into energy. But a tiny amount of mass stores a massive amount of energy based on E equals MC squared. You see, the C is the speed of light, and that's a unfathomably huge number. And then you square it, which is times it by itself, which creates a enormous number. And then you times it by the mass, and it doesn't matter, even if it's a small paper clip, the mass times that huge number equals a massive amount of energy. And this is why nukes are so damn scary. And this equation, which has been hidden from humans since, since uh, the dawn of time, was discovered by the genius mathematician Albert Einstein. And he fully understood the consequences of this discovery to humanity. How do I know this? Because he once said, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. So while he didn't call out nuclear war specifically, he did understand that this powerful weapon and future weapons would no longer affect local society alone, but would in fact affect the entire world. It's even predicted by some nuclear experts that a massive nuclear exchange of weapons between two major superpowers would not only completely destroy hundreds of major cities in the blast and potentially billions of lives, but the radioactive fallout would also kill millions and perhaps billions moreover over the following years. And worse yet, Radioactive fallout in high doses can cause hyper-aggressive cancers in humans. Anyone who happens to be outside during a, a radioactive fallout situation would get the full exposure and they would become the literal walking dead. They just might not know it yet. And basements, they offer very little protection because you need feet not inches of dense concrete or packed earth in order to slow down this deadly onslaught of radioactive fallout. Not only this, but some folks believe the global temperatures would plummet after such a nuclear exchange. This is due to the massive amount of dust and ash that get, would get thrust into our upper atmosphere. And this would significantly reduce the intensity of solar rays from the sun reaching down to the earth, which in turn would make growing crops anywhere near current yields all but impossible. And it would create world wide famines for decades to come. Unless you've been living under a rock, we all know that worldwide political tensions continue to escalate and more and more rogue nation states are pushing to join nuclear proliferation club. All these facts add up to one hell of a scary future. And that's why nuclear war is at the top of this threat list. Number two, super AI. I used to think that super AI was just some made up silly Hollywood trope. I mean, the Terminator movies, yeah, they were interesting in the mid 80s and early 90s, but back then to me, it had little semblance of reality. Well, I now believe I was totally wrong. 
I've changed my mind after reading an incredible article about super AI from the blog Wait But Why. This article lays out an incredible risk of super AI in a way that's easy to understand, but with enough detail to really punch you in the gut. And the truth is that article is so well done, you need to go read that after you watch this video. And I'm gonna try to go over just the brief short summary of the arguments and lay out some of the details here right now, okay? First off, super AI is not as far off from reality as most people think. Why? Because technological advancement, it's not linear, it's exponential. That just basically means that the time between one major technological advancement and the next one, it's shrinking faster and faster. For example, computing power has nearly doubled every 18 months. At that rate, at the very beginning, at the dawn of computer power, you'd see very little progress for a very long time, right? Then suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, in the blink of an eye, computers have the same brain power as humans. And this is why I believe that super AI, it's not very far off. A best guess based on expert consensus is around 40 years or so. And that might be too conservative. Why? because we've already seen evidence of robots making their own decisions and some computer programs beating humans in complicated strategic games such as chess and go. And yes, these AI systems are not super AI yet. Super AI would be achieved when a thinking robot connects to the internet and it's able to learn and download all humans have ever written and ever known. And with all this intellectual power of new age physics and nanoparticles and quantum mechanics and psychology and biology and philosophy, such a super AI computer would now be considered a conscious entity and would be way smarter than any human. And this is not by a small margin either, by a massive amount. We're talking godlike super intelligence. And with such super intellect, what are such computers now capable of? Well, damn near anything. And will these awake, conscious robots, will they have a moral compass? Will they adopt to human-based ethics? Perhaps they might. If, big if, humans program them with one. But we humans, we're, we're not nearly as smart as we think we are. And it's way harder than it seems to put human-based moral guardrails into a computer program. And this assumes humans could even agree on morals, which we all know is a big reason for the massive rifts in society since, you know, Adam and Eve. The best attempt that I've come across to write such a code says something like this, quote, our coherent extrapolated volition is our wish if we knew more, thought faster, were more the people we wish we were, had grown up further together, where the extrapolation converges rather than diverges, where our wishes cohere rather than interfere, extrapolated as we wish that extrapolated, interpreted as we wish interpreted, end quote. Or as I would say it to regular folks like you and me, we realize we don't know as much as we think. So please take pity on us and treat us like we'd like to be treated if indeed we knew as much as you know now. And oh, please don't eliminate us. Thanks. If we are able to maintain some sort of human moral compass within super AI computers, perhaps they'll help humanity usher in a better future, a utopia without disease or famine or strife or aging. And if we fail, if they consider humans to be the cancer to be eliminated and the root of all the problems, I mean, if you were super intelligent, would you want to save humanity or just get rid of us and move on? No one knows. But if they decide to eliminate us, they will have the tech and the knowledge to do so with ease in any number of different ways, right? Nuclear bombs, cyber attacks, nano weapons, a super AI could get access to everything, launch anything, or just create whatever it needs out of thin air. They'd be able to trick humans, manipulate leaders, and save or ruin us all. If it's amoral, or worse, evil, we don't stand a chance. Now the point of this is not to try to figure out exactly how this will all play out. The point is that super AI is a real potential threat to humanity. We're on thin ice here. And that's why I believe that super AI is a major threat to society. Okay, before I go on, if you're enjoying learning about this stuff, do me a huge favor and subscribe. Also, hit that like button and share this video with anyone who you think would find this stuff interesting. It keeps me creating more content just like this. Thanks. Number three, cyber warfare. Have you ever heard the term zero day exploits? It's a term that's used in the hacker world in reference to the, the most powerful and the most potent software vulnerabilities. And these zero day vulnerabilities are at the heart of a new aged underground arms race. 
Why? Because hoarding these zero-day exploits allows nation states to spy on each other with ease through tech devices and the internet. And most extreme examples of this are tech that allows anyone with a zero day to infiltrate anyone's phone anywhere in the world passively. That means that you don't need to get an active click first. That's right. The best, maybe, maybe I should say the worst, zero day exploits can get into any secure system and pull whatever levers it chooses unbeknownst to the users. And this goes way beyond spying. I'm talking about blowing up nuclear plants from within or making changes to PLC controllers or shutting down power plants or frying electrical transformers, cutting off oil's pipelines or refiners, messing with food delivery systems and logistics, which will cause havoc to critical supply chains. All these possible threats are laid out in a gripping book called This Is How They Tell Me The World ends. It's an excellent book if you want to know more about this threat, including the history and how we got where we are today and what the future may hold. The bottom line is I'm now convinced cyber warfare is one of the most underappreciated threats to harm society right now. Unlike super AI, this is not a future threat. It's a current ongoing underground war. Most people have very little ideas taking place, at least not until their power's out and the gas stations are empty with no end in sight. Then we'll fully understand and suffer the dire consequences. Number four, bioengineering. <sighs> Why do humans have to mess around with things that we don't fully understand? I mean, how does it make any sense to create biological chemicals and biological weapons that can destroy mankind? Because that is where bioengineering is headed. Again, as technology advances exponentially, the ability for more and more people to access bioengineering knowledge, skills, and tools, well, it continues to grow as well. And I don't care how secure any bio facility claims to be, existential risks are not worth the rewards. And it won't be just nation states with this tech for long to manipulate biological diseases to make them more dangerous and more contagious. Every year, biotech gets cheaper and more accessible to more and more groups of humans. I mean, how many years in the future will some highly intelligent, disgruntled high school student decide to replicate an Ebola virus that's more contagious and more deadly? That possibility is not science fiction, sure. We're not there yet, but such a reality, it's on the horizon. And well before we ever get there, the terrorist groups and rogue nation states will be there first, perhaps only a few years away from such immense power. I've even heard it may be possible in the future to create a bioengineered virus that only targets specific people with specific DNA profiles. So let's say it's a deadly virus that only kills you if you have a certain percentage of bloodlines. I'm talking about European or Asian or African or Native American bloodlines, right? The sad truth is we're already messing with things we don't understand and any mistake or attack could prove deadly to a vast portion of humanity. Is it possible to avoid such a terrible fate? To figure out a way to control these existential bioengineering advancements? To only use them for good and not evil? Well, with humans, the answer's no. Number five, nanoweapons. As we discussed earlier, nuclear bombs are a massive threat in destruction potential. The one limit we have as humans is we, we're not able to convert every piece of mass completely into energy yet. So because of this, most nukes that we have on this planet are relatively large in size, and they certainly require some type of rocket launcher or they're dropped from planes. Perhaps they could be loaded onto a semi-trailer and blown up somewhere. But we can all agree today, we can't fit a nuclear bomb into a purse, right? Well, with the advancement of nanotechnology, that may no longer be the case. What if I told you that the tech to be able to put a micro-nuclear weapon into a purse was just around the corner. Nanotechnology opens up the possibility to manufacture many new components so small they're difficult to screen and detect. Such a miniature weapon could be less than five pounds in size, and it could contain about a hundred tons of TNT that could easily destroy a large building. You see, these nano-device machines are much smaller than the size of a strand of a human hair, making them nearly undetectable to the human eye. And in the future, 
We could have insect-like nanobots that could be programmed to perform various tasks such as spying on political opponents or contaminating the water supply in a major city. Or a nano drone could fly into a room, drop a poison into food or drink to target a particular individual. Again, the exponential growth of all this tech, it's a common denominator here. As all these technologies continue to appear, the risks associated with them also continue to grow. And humans are going to be behind the curveball in terms of controlling or combating such tech if bad actors get a hold of them. I mean, having this sort of tech in the hands of major nation states, well, that's scary enough. But what happens if small groups or individuals gain access? All right, if you're still watching this video, then I know you're into this stuff. So do me a huge favor and subscribe right now. Also, hit that like button and share this video with, with anyone you think would also find this stuff interesting. It really helps me out and helps me create more content just like this. Thanks. Number six. Widespread famines and water shortages. This is the first threat to humanity on this list that's not directly rooted in technology. I mean, famines and water shortages, well, they're, they're ancient threats, right? From the very beginning of human history, the fear of starvation and dehydration, it's been terrorizing us all. In the past, famines would primarily come from either weather-related events such as floods or droughts, or war. And while these root cause of famine still exist today, the scope and the severity and the likelihood are all on the rise. And not only that, but there are a few new contributors as well. For example, topsoil depletion, it's a very real problem. One in which will not only result in less food due to lower crop yields, but also the food that's harvested will have less nutrients. So over time, the amount of food and the value of that food, well, it'll undermine our already precarious food scarcity. So even if wars don't break out, and even if politicians work together, the depletion of topsoil nutrients may no longer be able to support the extreme size of humanity. Again, I don't have an exact timetable here, and perhaps with all our new modern tech, we can figure this problem out. You know, I'm hopeful, but the trends are concerning, and the risk of worldwide famine, it's increasing at an alarming rate. Number seven, tyrannical governments due to one, postmodern ideas, and two, decentralization of narrative and money supply. Okay, strap in. This one's a bit complicated, okay? But I think it's really important to talk about. The increased potential for tyrannical governments, especially in traditional free Western societies, is on the rise. And I believe there are two main forces driving this trend towards tyranny. Number one, the rise of postmodern nihilism. And number two, decentralization. Okay, let me dive into each of these a bit to help you understand what I mean. Number one, the rise of postmodern nihilism. This is a philosophical threat that was brought to my attention by Dr. Jordan Peterson. Perhaps you've heard of him? If not, he's a psychologist from Canada who's been a very outspoken critic of the new radical left. Now, his arguments are full of nuance and details I can only hope to touch on. So following is my best attempt to summarize his arguments. Okay, here we go. Over the past few decades, our universities had promoted a postmodern nihilistic doctrine. This way of thinking has absolutely dominated the humanities and the social sciences. The postmodernists completely reject the structure of Western civilization. They call Western civilization a phallocentric society, one that's steeped in male domination and is oppressive and self-serving to everyone except for privileged white males. And of course, there's a thread of truth in these concerns because there's never been a shortage of flaws in any structured society, right? No matter how people decide to structure things, there will always be winners and losers because as humans, we're not angels and this is not heaven. There will be those in power and those without. There's just no way around that fact. Western society, even with all its flaws, is still far better than tyrannical governments and communism when it comes to individual freedoms and human rights. And it's not even close. But postmodernists, they don't accept that. They don't have a shred of gratitude in their philosophy. They're tortured by resentment and bitterness in spite of the fact that they're bathed in relative wealth. And living with resentment as your main ethos, it's a horrible, destructive way to live. Postmodernists also don't believe in the individual. They don't believe in logic. They don't believe in dialogue to figure things out through an exchange of ideas. They don't agree with letting others speak 
with wrong ideas. It's not part of their ethos. They believe your fundamental identity is group fostered. You're just an exemplar of your race, your sex, and your ethnicity. And based on these categories, you either fall into a group called victim or a group called oppressor. And this is similar to Marxist ideas of elite versus workers. This creates a struggle for power. Oppressors are vilified and must be removed from power and demonized. It's never about competence. It's about perceived oppression for the sins of the past. No exceptions. They believe anyone in the oppressor's category must be removed and will no longer have a seat at the table, regardless of their individual contributions, their morality, or their competence. This is a dangerous idea of oppressors versus victims, and it's behind much of the historical human tragedies around the world. When you no longer run a society with the most competent people, things don't go well. Complex systems tend to break economically, logistically, and collapse in on themselves. Sorry, but put Putting those who are not competent in places of power, such as CEOs or government agencies or judicial positions or politicians, is complete folly for society at large. Having people who are really good at being victims gain power and influence and run critical businesses and government agencies, that creates an escalating downward spiral into economic depression and collapse. Again, we have lots of issues in Western society, no doubt, and they should be addressed within the current system to make it so much better and fair and support those who have been oppressed. But it is a very, very dangerous experiment for humanity to throw it all away and to start over with absolute power in the hands of those who are good at being victims. Now, on top of all this trend to throw over the current Western culture, let's add in a bit of decentralization into the equation, and you have a very potent brew for tyranny. Fact. Those who control the narrative and the money supply control the people. So what do you think happens when nation states, who have been controlling the narratives and the money supplies for centuries, they lose their control? The last time there was a massive narrative upheaval was after the first scalable printing press was developed, sometime in the 1400s. Soon after that, the powerful church and priests and monarchies, well, they can no longer control the masses with their interpretations of the Bible and other works of literature. With the printing press, people could, for the first time, read, and decide for themselves. This one invention alone turned the world on its head. The centuries following this invention destroyed the power structure of the priests and the monarchies. Many historians believe that the printing press was the major contributor to the Thirty Year War that changed the world from monarchy rule and gave rise to the modern nation state. Well, the next wave of narrative upheaval is here, now, with the internet. And this time, the modern nation state is in the upheaval crosshairs. But just like the historical change from monarchy to nation states, will the ones in current power willingly give up that control? Or will they enact more tyranny in a desperate effort to keep and maintain that control? This shift in control is one of the key reasons why tyranny will continue to rise. In the recent past, nation states, well, they used mainstream media to control the news narrative, propaganda. How? Well, there are only a handful of news networks and a few newspapers, so the government could exercise pressure on these gatekeepers and keep the information in check. But with the internet and social media, the narrative control is slipping away fast. Sites like Twitter and Substack, there's no longer any barrier to entry into the narrative or truth domain. Anyone with a computer and a voice can create a media channel and have inconvenient ideas that go counter to what the government would like can be distributed across the globe with the click of a button. And that's why many of these inconvenient ideas are being labeled as disinformation or misinformation. That's the government trying to keep control of the narrative by shutting down the inconvenient messaging. Joe Rogan is a perfect example of this. His podcast draws in 11 million listeners per show on average. This is much bigger than more traditional news media such as CNN primetime which has less than a million per show, but Joe doesn't cover the news and information in small, unsatisfying quick takes or gotcha sound bites. Instead, he tends to deep dive into nuanced conversations over multiple hours about difficult topics covering philosophy and politics and challenging the experts. This is very inconvenient for the government and those in power. And this trend, this inconvenience, will only get worse as the governments around the world will not go quietly into the night. So to continue to hold on to power for for as long as possible, they will be forced to attack those who challenge them, attack them by shutting them down and getting rid of them if necessary. This 
is tyranny 101. And not only that, but nation states, they also need to control the money supply. They need to be able to track individual incomes and tax them at rates that keep the money flowing. If they lose the ability to track and tax, what happens? Well, the entire nation state structure fails. If governments stay large and revenues go down, it's only a matter of time for things to get bad. And before the advent of cryptocurrencies, there was no real threat of losing the money supply control. But now with crypto and encryption, there are more ways to get around the government taxation. And not only that, but more and more billionaires who are able to leave their country of origin and they can move to somewhere else more friendly to their bottom line. Heck, some even live on yachts and they try to avoid taxation altogether. These super rich people are avoiding massive taxation, the money that the modern nation states need to survive into the future. If the taxation supply continues to shrink, then the size of governments will be forced to attack those that they believe are cheating and raise taxes on everyone else across the board to protect their size and power. But as taxes rise, more people will be incentivized to find ways to avoid the tax. So this is just another dangerous downward spiral where a nation state will be forced to become more and more tyrannical to keep their power to control the populace. Because again, those in control of the narrative and the money supply, they have all the power. And these two major trends, dangerous philosophical ideas and decentralization, are now pointing to greater and greater tyranny. Perhaps even lawlessness, collapse society, where your own government is not your friend, but the enemy. Number eight, antibiotic resistance. The medical miracle of antibiotics have saved countless lives over the centuries, but this miracle may be quickly coming to an end. Bacterial infections have killed untold numbers of folks throughout human history. Why? Because without antibiotics, it doesn't take much for an infection to fester, to overwhelm your immune system to the point of death. It was a pretty common way to die before the advent of modern day antibiotics. Now, with antibiotics, you get an infection, you go to the doctor. They prescribe you the proper dosages and the infection miraculously just goes away. But due to our human tendency to not finish the prescribed antibiotic regimen, not all those sneaky bacteria die. A few of those little buggers survive. And those that survive, well, they build up a bit of resistance to the antibiotics. And this is really bad because over the years, the bacterial microbes who have been repeatedly exposed to the antibiotics but survive, they build up increasing resistance to them. So now, when you take the meds that should kill the infection, they don't. And this has been happening at an alarming rate over the past few years. More bacteria are getting harder and harder to kill, and our best antibiotics are no longer working. And not only that, but at the same time, we're running out of new antibiotics to fight these resistant bacterial strains. Basically, the trend right now is the modern miracle of antibiotics is losing its magic and fast. In the future, it could have more deaths from bacterial infection more in line with the past. For example, in 2019, more than 1.2 million people potentially more, died as a direct result of antibiotic-resistant infection. And this is probably going to get worse, as we have yet to come up with any sort of alternative treatments. Such a future of mass death due to antibacterial resistance could create an untenable strain on our medical systems and many of our other modern-day grids. This threat could lead to an exponentially downward spiral of death and economic collapse. Number nine, inflation. I want to talk about dangerous out of control inflation that can harm a society. And we don't need to look far or research hard to find some real examples of this. I mean, in Hungary, just after World War II, prices doubled nearly every 15 hours. In Zimbabwe, in 2007 and 8, prices doubled every single day. Venezuela's CPI grew by 65% thousand percent from 2017 to 2018. I mean, if we saw this type of hyperinflation in the U.S., a jug of milk that costs four dollars today may cost eight dollars tomorrow, followed by another price hike of sixteen dollars the next day. If such hyperinflation was left unchecked, by the end of the month, that four dollar gallon of milk would cost over a billion dollars. So, so basically the dollar would be completely worthless. And that would cause an immediate societal collapse overnight. Scary, yes, yes. But to be honest, I don't think any kind of U.S. inflation would get to that level of aggression. But how about slightly elevated inflation, but for a longer period of time? If left unchecked, 
even a 10% inflation per month over time would put insane amounts of pressure on an economy. Day by day, year by year, everything would get more expensive. This would be disastrous for anyone on fixed income, such as retired folks. Everyone on the economic ladder, from the poor to the lower class, to the middle class, etc., they would all move down a peg. So if you're middle class, your buying power would diminish and unless you worked harder and got a big raise, you'd plunge down into the lower class. And those in the lower class, they'd probably plunge down into the poor or the homeless. Do you think this sort of trend would undermine society as a whole? I think such an environment would be ripe for civil unrest, massive strife, and anarchy. And I'm talking about mass looting of stores because paper money or digital money only has worth because people agree it has worth. Others lose confidence in this fact. The value of it goes down fast. Or if a corrupt, out-of-control government just decides to keep printing money, then the dollars you currently hold lose value over time. In the past, governments would devalue a currency by adding less rare metals into the coin. They would replace the gold and the silver, the higher value stuff with lower value alternatives. The populace would detect this, they'd know, and they would see that fraud. And so they would require more coins, more gold and silver, to make up for the difference. Well, the same idea comes into play with modern day governments. They print money out of thin air to pay for more services and foreign aid. And if you print money faster than the amount of goods and services that can be bought, inflation will eventually catch up. At this point, you must either slow down the economy through rising interest rates or stop printing money to stop the inflation. Slower economic activity slows the speed of money being exchanged and allows the government to buy back some of the extra dollars sloshing around. But this all requires government officials to show immense self-control. The greed and power have always proven to be too much for humans to handle, and the future will be no different. Societies will collapse and new ones will rise from their ashes. Or the most profound quote in all of history, this too shall pass. I honestly believe the risk to our current modern way of life is at an all time high. I don't see these risks becoming any less or less severe over time. I actually see the opposite. And yet I still hold out hope that we can thread the needle and come out the other side of these dangers, both healthy and prosperous. But hope is not a strategy. And if you want any chance to protect yourself and those you love from the future, you must stop living a fragile life. You need to start living what I call a resilient life. It's the only way to take matters into your own hands and avoid being a victim of future turmoil. And the first step to doing that is to figure out where you stand on the fragile versus resilient spectrum. Are you currently fragile? Are you resilient? How much food, water, medical supplies do you have? Can you ride out a multi-week power outage? Do you have a backup heat source? These are all questions you can answer and figure out exactly where you stand. Only then can you finally do something about it. And the good news is I've got a video right here that'll help you do just that. Click here now and learn how to calculate how resilient or fragile you are. And until next time, prepare, adapt, and overcome.